In 2004, he began his association, his reassociation with the University of Tennessee, this time uh, teaching architecture courses. Uh, he became a distinguished lecturer, an adjunct assistant professor, and in 2009, director uh, for the Institute uh, for, of Smart, uh, for Smart Structures. Uh, more about that in just a bit. Uh, he also founded his own architectural firm, it's Hoskins Rose Architects. Uh, at UT, he has had, that I counted, three honors for teaching, eight citations for creativity and service. He's been a participant in, a key participant in, uh, grants that have been received totaling more than half a million dollars. We're very happy to welcome back James Rose, T talking on net zero for projects from the Institute for Smart Structures. Thank you, Amanda Mark and Robin. I think I may have to move my control center. Oh, are you in your life? I may be in your lap. No, I don't mind. I need to hear you. Well, I will, we'll be good friends. It's 75 year old ears. You know, no problem. So I'm happy to be here today. This is actually my second gig here with Science Alliance. Back when we first started the solar decathlon effort, which I will be talking about here in a moment, I also came and spoke at this uh, day. So uh, as was mentioned, I have a little institute. It's a very small institute. It's me and one other fellow in engineering. That's how small it is. But the beauty of being small is we get to pick some pretty interesting projects to work on. And really, our claim is that we're interested in finding ways that our industrial partners in this region the technologies they produce, we're interested in finding architect architectural application of those technologies. And we're not interested only in, say, the specifics related to function. We're interested in, as the, the Romans used to respond to it, as firmness, commodity, and delight. All of the beautiful things we can do with this, with this new technology. So in the early years of our institute, we were looking at ways in which we can bring undergraduate architecture students opportunities to get hands-on experience with not only the design but the building uh, projects. So this first project I'm going to talk about quite briefly, this is called UT Zero. This is the first thing we did, the first project from the Institute. This is from 2009. And at this point, we were interested in potentially applying to be a competitor in the solar decathlon. And I'll get a little bit more into what that is, but that, that's, a, I guess, in every two-year project of the, of the Department of Energy, the challenge is students to build a functioning net zero house. So we thought we would do that on a very small scale. And we shoestring budgeted this thing. I think we did it for about $50,000. It was all fundraised by students, going to people, talking about the project, soliciting not only donations of time, money, and material, but also just having people to kind of go to as a reference in the community. And so what we created was something that tried to harness what we saw as sort of the potential for combining both a passive solar electric system and a passive solar thermal system. So solar electric is usually what you think of when you, when you see things like photovoltaics, solar panels, things on a roof that generate electricity. But maybe one of the more underutilized technologies that we have is solar thermal. So in this project, if you know the entire gentleman is standing, this was a south-facing structure. It was glazed with a sun trap right here. And the intent of this, as the diagram showed, was to give us the ability to harness the heat that's developed in that space when we wanted it, but also to exhaust it and create an insulating barrier when we did. And this worked quite well. We were able to uh, heat and cool this all with the, the power budget and the uh, thermal energy budget generated entirely within its own structure. This was never attached to uh, the external grid. And it sat in Game Day Village uh, over across from Torchbearer for about three years. So not only did this give us the ability to, to test whether or not we could fundraise with students, build with students, and actually create a meaningful research project that pushed forward the boundaries of our knowledge, but it gave us a place to talk about this to the general public. So it wasn't unusual that on a typical game day, we'd have fans coming by, and our students would be out there working on it, remaining the booth and talking to them about the, the potential futures of architecture, where buildings relied on their own power generation. So this is a, a fascinating concept that we'll get into in a few more of the other projects. And I hope you'll see a continuum uh, of the next projects that, that I will show you. But they all kind of started here. And this is just kind of a, a show you that I actually do work on these projects. 
Uh, and, that, and that guy did not break his hand on my project. Though, so. But students did all the work here. They did the planning, they did the design, they, they did the actual final construction, and just some images of what we created. Oddly enough, this looks like the rendering. That's always nice, right? That, that the students can actually achieve what they set out to, to, uh, to make. And then just kind of a snippet of some of the details. One of the things that we're interested in, what is the aesthetic manifestation of a south-facing sun space? What is the aesthetic manifestation of a solar array? What is the aesthetic manifestation of sun shading devices? So in this project, we didn't quite get where we wanted to get, but you'll see it in the next one. One of the interesting things about this one is we, we're, we're looking at uh, lighting technologies. This was in the very early days of light emitting diodes, and they, they gave off very blue light. If you have some early LED fixtures in your house, you probably know what I'm talking about. So we put them in the floor and we bounced them off the ceiling to try and get a warmer quality of light. Uh, that was interesting, just how much that technology has changed in the last few years. All right, so here it is. This is our, our actual solar cap on it. So we, we, by building basically a third of one of these on our own budget, we were able to make a pretty compelling case to the Department of Energy that we should be allowed to do this in a solar cap on So we applied in 2010 and we got into the 2011 solar cap on And this is our project. It was high to living life. Uh, the intent being that we were, we were trying to make the most open, the most visually open, uh, project that we can make. It's pretty easy to make a, a very efficient home if you build it like an igloo cooler and don't put any windows in it, but we wanted to try to do the opposite. So just kind of a refresher on solar decathlon. Uh, in past years before, I think between 2001 and 2011, it had been on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And that was really the reason we wanted to go. We wanted to be in America's living room and show everyone what we could do. And unfortunately, the Park Service decided that we were putting too much of a dent in the uh, National Mall, so they moved us to Potomac Park. Very well. But in the end, um, they put us in the outfield of the, the baseball diamond. We had a glass house in the outfield of the baseball diamond. It worked out better than you might imagine. But there were 19 other teams. Uh, some of these were from uh, China, uh, several of them from the United States. Pretty much at this time, Solar Decathlon had competitors from all over the world. And as you might imagine, the Decathlon has 10 categories. Five of them were pretty objective, right? Can you heat hot water to a certain temperature? Can you reach net zero? Uh, can you maintain a, a standard uh, temperature humidity in your home uh, uh, across the 10 days of the, the competition? And there were other five, which were a little weird. They were very subjective, so they were jury. So there was a jury on architecture. And oddly enough, that jury only had one architect on it. The rest of them were realtors. So there's some weird things when you work with the Department of Energy. I, 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 some of you may already know what I'm alluding to. Uh, but in the end, that, that was the criteria that were judged on. So that's how we started the design process. We looked at that criteria. We tried to be smart about it. We knew from a research point of view that we wanted to combine a passive system and an active system, thermal and electric, and we wanted to try and make the most beautiful expression of those technologies. But we also wanted to win this competition. So we uh, created a team, a huge team. I, I, I like to say that at one time, this was probably the second largest architecture and engineering firm in Tennessee, where all of these students and faculty were pulled together. And the interesting thing, if you look at the, the, the pie chart, you, know, you have architects and you have engineers, which you might expect. We had graphic designers. We had folks from the business school. We had folks from civil engineering. We had people who had interior design, mechanical engineering. So this was a cross cut to everything the University of Tennessee does well. And we also had some uh, folks joining us from Oak Ridge National Labs. So when we get all these smart people in a room, what I asked them to do was to, to develop the concepts that would underpin the design of the project. Architecture is not one of those things where you just get to sketch something and, and you know, have it built just because you want to bond with your own ego. Unfortunately, it may, may sound like that, but this is what we did. We had to sit down and brainstorm through. We had to cross-cut across all of these disciplines and try to come together on points that we could all agree upon. Because to have a team this big, you have to know where you're going to start. So this, this was our idea. There are six points here. Some of these sound like they're pretty normative for a solar house, harvesting, sun's, harvesting the sun's energy. But we were trying to do this not only with the electrical energy from the photovoltaics, but we were trying to do this with the thermal system. Leaving a small footprint, maximizing transparency and view. Here's a weird one, living compactly and space transforming in the service of function. So we tried to make the smallest dwelling we could make that two people could live comfortably. And I'll let you guys determine whether we did that well or not, you can take a look at it. But this, this was done again in 2010, 2011. What's all the rage now? Tiny houses. 
so I'm not saying we invented it, maybe we did. <laughs> and then we looked back at our regional history. We've been designing net zero in East Tennessee for as long as there have been people in our region. I love this project. This is an essay in one material. Everything in this is made out of wood. The structure, the enclosure, the hinges, and the doors, and the hayloft are made out of wood. Everything in this project is wood. You can't really see it well in this image, but that cantilever beam tapers as it goes out. These were not engineers, but somehow they knew that the, the point of greatest, greatest tension was, or greatest force was happening at the haunch, and as you went out, you didn't need as much material. They didn't have to do that. But these people had a fantastic understanding of the material they were working with. So there's an idea of using the material well, using only what you need. But also, look at this line right here. They're defining space with only an overhang. I think this is the world's first modern building. It's just that no one talks about it. So we use this idea that we could have a fairly compact form. We could have a lot of transparency. And the only things that would be solid would be two cores, just like in that cantilever. So in this plan, the things that you see toned out gray are the only fixed walls in the project. So on the left-hand side, this is our mechanical room and our kitchen. And on the right-hand side is the bed, the closet, and the bathroom. Now, it's a little bit difficult to see it in the plan, but all of those things have the ability to transform based on the function you want them to have. So in this view, I'm standing at the kitchen, looking across the island, and I'm looking back towards the core that has the closet, the bathroom, and the bed. <coughs> And that bed is slid somewhat out of the wall. But instead of being a Murphy bed, it folds out like this. It actually is like a little caterpillar. And it snakes out from the cavity of the wall. And also you can see there the transparency of, of that outer enclosure, which I'll get to in a moment. But here's the opposite. So the intent was that we gave you a room that was 30 feet long, 12 feet wide, with a ceiling of about 8 feet two, and all of the walls were completely transparent. We have the ability to have blinds there to, to uh, modify for privacy. And then we again incorporate the lighting in the floor. This time we have the ability to change the color of the lighting. That's why it's UT orange right now. Uh, but the intent of this was to make a space that could be completely aerial. If you needed it to be your dining room, it could be your dining room. If you needed it to be your bedroom, it could be. If you were having a guest over, you could configure it for that. So the entire idea was to have one very nice space that you could modify. So looking back at that kitchen, there are doors that entirely close in it. They're shown open right now, but if you're trying to, to work after you know, having breakfast and you didn't want to be looking at your dirty dishes, you can close that stuff off. So back to that outer enclosure. So when I showed you that very first slide, there was a south-facing sun space. It was about four and a half feet deep. That's a lot of wasted space because in the summer mode, we want to actually ventilate that space and we don't use it as living space. So in this project, we did a, a lot of uh, modeling to figure out how small we could make it. So this is a section through the outer wall of the living lighthouse. That's only an inch gap between an outer single pane and an inner quadruple pane piece of glazing. The R value of that assembly at the center point of the glass is about 25. So that doesn't sound like much, but that's better than a 2 by 6 step frame wall with standard bat insulation right in here. And I can look right through it. So not only does that have a high R value, it has a really interesting active component to it. So this diagram, think about this kind of as the evolution of the diagram I showed you at first. In the heating mode, uh, the overhang, which you can barely see on top of that view, which is typically protecting the glass in the summer, it's designed specifically so that winter sun creeps in underneath it. And that array, the solar array, is the sun shading. And there, in the, in the heating mode, we have low angle uh, winter sun. It heats the south side and it creates a convection current and draws air in from the low side through that vertical glazed area into the space. So if we had, say, 30 degree temperature outside, we can raise the temperature inside that cavity another 30 degrees. So we have 60 degree incoming air, and then the mini split heat pump only has to raise it 10 or 12 degrees for you to be comfortable. And then to create a little bit of insulation, <coughs> blow a little bit of the air that we were exhausting through the opposite wall. And that gives us a high R value on that side. <coughs> The opposite is also true. In the, cooling, uh, in the cooling mode, the overhang is completely protecting that glass so we get no direct rays of the sun. And then we bring in the air off the north side, bring it inside, and then we exhaust it down the south to further buffer that side. So the cooling mode is cool, but the heating mode is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we still have this project. Uh, I'll show you in a second where it ended up. But we're very, very close to being able to heat and cool this house at a certain level of comfort without ever turning on the mini split. 
But because we're net zero, we have the power to, to produce that, so the, the energy we need to run the main split if we have to. So it's almost a completely passive structure without the use of, of the uh, electric systems. This diagram is just in there to kind of give you a sense of the competition results. So when we, uh, I think this is over the 10 days of the competition, competition, the black line is our energy production, the red line is the actual use. So if you took the area of the curves, we used far less than we produced. And you can see the lag based on when we produce the energy and when we use it, which is a whole other conversation for a different time. The other part of what we're trying to achieve is you, did, you shouldn't have to have a PHE to operate your solar panels, right? That, that, that was an issue that a lot of people felt like you would never be able to truly mainstream a solar and electric system because it was a complex system to maintain and run. So we were working with our graphic designers and our computational science folks, and we created a, an app that would go on your phone or your tablet, and this ran your entire house. And the interesting thing about this is now that's fairly common. You can actually go online and download these systems. In 2010, what we had to use was the same automation system the Volkswagen plant used to automate their assembly. It was about a $30,000 piece of automation software that was donated to us, and we created this front end software. But the, the beauty of this is though, that you could tap, say, the cooking icon, and it would turn on the vent hood, it would uh, shut off the rest of the ventilation system, it would fire up the cooktop, turn on the lights in the dining room. So one button could do eight or nine different things. We're leaving for vacation, you could press a button, it would lock the house, turn the blinds down, set the HVAC back, and you would never have to touch any of those things. So this worked quite well, but now you can buy a Nest thermostat for about 200 bucks, and it does the majority of the things that we did here and we had to create from scratch. So we did well in this competition. It was the first time we entered. Highly unusual to score in the top 10 on, on the first try. We did quite well. We did, uh, we're number one in energy balance and hot water, third for appliances engineering, architecture fifth, which doesn't make sense to me, and then home entertainment ninth. Again, home entertainment, not sure why that's in there, but that's the way they wanted to do it. The thing that really annoys me about this, we blew the top out of the, uh, the power generation. We produced, over the course of the competition, about twice as much power as we needed. But the DOE said, nope, you were only supposed to hit net zero, so we're not going to give you more points for going beyond it. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. But here's why we didn't really care. This house was always designed to have a history after the solar decathlon. So as soon as we were done, this went on the Tennessee tour. It's a fully mobile unit. We took it around to 10 cities. Uh, went back to Washington, D.C. actually in 2012 for the Folklife Festival. And everywhere we go, we can immediately set up because we're completely net zero. And this is its uh, resting place. This is the Children's Museum in Oak Ridge. Some of you may have already been there. This sits in the backyard next to their beautiful garden. And now when they have their programs during the summer where they bring uh, students out to cook uh, and eat vegetables from their garden, they use our kitchen and they use our bathroom. So this is now actually a functioning part of the community. It has 10.9 kilowatts of, of solar power. It's a, it's a TVA generation partner and it's offsetting the energy bills for the rest of the facility. So we always knew this thing would live longer than the solar decathlon, and we did kind of take a, a gun to a knife fight on this project, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. So that kind of, I, I appreciate the applause. I, I rarely get that. <laughs> so that sets us up for the new stuff. Uh, this is Amy, which I'll explain in a bit. But this came from our governor's chair. So in the state of Tennessee, there are endowed governor's chairs. The, the only one in architecture is for energy and urbanism. And this is uh, a joint appointment uh, with Oak Ridge, uh, Lab, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab and the University of Tennessee. And for us, it wasn't just one person. It was the entire firm of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. So to kind of put that in context, SOM, I th think right now five of the 10 tallest buildings in the world are designed by SOM. And they are not only um, well known for the quality of their design and sort of the audacity of their engineering, but also the sustainability of their project. So it's been a fantastic partner. But what happened here was Oak Ridge had several different technologies that they were using at the time, and they were looking for ways that they could be combined. One of them is large scale 3D printing. Another one was the ability to do a bi-directional power transfer. So instead of just charging your phone, could the phone actually charge the device it was attached to, but they wanted to do it on the scale of a car and, 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 a, um, and a house. And then they had ideas about how this might help offset 
I showed you that lag between power production and power use. There's this thing called the duck curve, when we produce way more power during times of day when we don't use it. So this project was, was pretty interesting for all of those reasons, but then the fact that they wanted to wrap this up and try and make this an architectural thing, to take all of these ideas and apply them in support of architecture. So AMI stands for Additive Manufacturing and Integrated Energy. Additive Manufacturing being 3D printing and, and Integrated Energy being the fact that this house produces more power than it needs and can share it with a hybrid automobile, and that automobile can also pr produce power and share it with the house. So the ability for your house to sit there and produce power and push it to your car while you're not using that power. So that the battery in the car or the battery in the house becomes the sink for that extra energy and kind of offsetting the duck curve. So several interesting kind of components to this. The primary design here was done by Skidmore Owings and Merrill. I was part of the team with the students at the university to explore ideas about what it means to have a new material. It's really unusual that an architect is handed a new material. When was the last time we had a new material? Maybe, maybe steel or flat glass. And when those things come to an architect, they have to think through, how do we use this? It's a brand new material. There's a long history of buildings, but it's very few times when that new material is, is brought forward. So in this case, we're trying to think about something that is a process of accretion and deposition. So thinking about laying bricks together or building with sticks or Anything that we had thought about before in terms of, of human con construction, it didn't really help us. So we were looking at natural forms. So one of the things that you'll see in this project is that everything is curvilinear, and everything is sort of created in a way that a seashell would grow, and much less like you would build a house with bricks or wooden studs. So this is the plan. The intent here was not necessarily to replicate a home, but to just speak to it enough that a person could understand that this might be a technology that could be applied to it later on. So it was more of a technology demonstrator than it ever was intended to be a kind of a freestanding home. And you can see in the uh, exterior enclosure, this is about, it's about an inch and a half. And that's, that is the structural frame of the building. And here's a view of the interior. This again is the rendering. I like to show the rendering and to show the, the fact that we actually built what we said we would build. That's a fairly controversial slide. You'll notice that the floor in that slide is orange in the foreground and it's red in the background. Orange, of course, is the University of Tennessee color and red is Skidmore Owings and Merrill's color. So I guess you can tell who won that argument. But one of the fascinating things about designing with 3D printing is that the building first exists in the virtual realm. It exists as ones and zeros first before it ever becomes a finite object. And it's really the only material that works that way, right? We can design a building to be built out of concrete or steel, but those things have to pass through a process of going through shop drawings, they have to be engineered. There are several different phases to getting to that final version. Whereas with this digital version, I can print a model this is a 3D printed model of this project, or I can print the same, the full size piece out of the same digital file. And perhaps more scary though, is that there is no middle person between me designing it and it going to the big printer and being printed. So there's no other set of eyes. So what it requires of the architect is to really understand what it is that they're making. So this is the 3D printer at uh, Oak Ridge National Labs at the Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. You can kind of see the corduroy texture here, and I've got a plank of this on the table. Yeah, if you'd like to just pass that around, feel free. So you can kind of see what a 3D printed piece of material looks like. This is what we called a C. So if you look at one of these bands right here, this is half of that. So that currently was the limitation of the size of the printer that we could have. Eventually, and I'll show you one later that's quite a bit bigger than that, but so the intent here was to connect C's, make rings, and stack those rings together to make Amy. Hopefully that'll play, there we go. So that's, that is what the final version is. So part of what we're trying to do is a ribbed thin shell structure. So this is much more akin to something like a nautilus shell than it is about a, any type of previous construction. And here it is, that this is at Clayton Holmes facility here in Knoxville where they were doing the final assembly. So here it is sitting on one of Clayton's standard chassis, but there's nothing standard about that enclosure system. And the way we uh, finally assembled this is we put a, a coating on the outside to prevent UV damage, and on the inside there was a secondary panel that sandwiched a, a vac vacuum insulation panel. So the exterior wall of this uh, project, again, is about an R value of 30, but it's only happening in an inch and a half. 
one of the interesting things about the form of this is that based on the orientation, it's a completely different structure. So in here, I'm standing looking through the transparent slot windows, looking in one direction. It's very open in this regard. Even though if you look at it directly from the side, you can see no windows. And that was done so that if we orient this with south over here, every single bit of the glazing is completely shaded again, so no direct gain on the glazing. And that weird looking vehicle in the background, this is the paired hybrid vehicle, which Oak Ridge also designed and printed. And here's a nighttime shot looking the other direction. So this house is able to produce at least enough power, if we call it a house, it's loosely a house, it produces its own power, it can share that power with a vehicle, and the vehicle can share power back. So you could imagine a future where the vehicle that you drive to work charges at work, and that power can be used in, in driving back home, and then if you don't need that power, you can dump that power into your house. And in the morning, you can either dump power from your house into your vehicle, or you can just drive the vehicle with the power that it has. So there's no real need then to have grid storage, because the storage becomes spread to all of the individual homes and vehicles. I like to call this picture the Jaws picture. <laughs> So th this is the team that was involved here. So we have uh, Clayton Holmes, we have Skidmore Owings and Merrill, we have the University of Tennessee, and we have Oak Ridge National Labs. So to me, this is fairly expressive of what the Institute for Smart Structures is. We like to get a lot of smart people in a room, give them a really complicated problem, and see how, that, how we can solve that in service of architecture. All right, so this now takes us into the, kind of the final phase here. I, I kind of threw in, a, uh, I think I said four projects, it's four and a half. There's a freebie in here I'll show you in a second. So this is Local Motors. Uh, Local Motors, you may have heard of them. They used to have a shop down, uh, downtown on uh, Market Square. They've since moved out to their final micro factory facility at Hardin Valley. But they are innovators in transportation. So not only did they, did they create the first 3D printed automobile, they are also working on an autonomous uh, uh, transit system, which will probably be one of the first truly implemented in the United States. And they have an interesting co-creation model, uh, whereby they issue these challenges on the web, and designers from all over the world can apply their ideas to that challenge. And if they're accepted, they become co-creators of that information. But uh, the, uh, I think it was the lab director for Local Motors saw the work that we had done on Amy, and he challenged our students with a small project. He said, we have a new facility, we have a conference room and an open space adjacent to our, our, uh, our um, this workspace adjacent to conference is what, what it was. They wanted a screen wall between two areas of their office. And he said, you have 600 pounds of material, what can you make me? So the students immediately kind of realized what we had been saying all along, you cannot look at previous types of construction to understand how to do this. So they looked at human bone. What you're seeing there is the trabicula the intersections of the, the finite small structure of bone. And they developed a way to create a parametric or a set of geometries that could inform the way these tubular structures were printed. And with that 600 pounds of material, they were able to create a screen wall that was about eight feet by 12 feet. So each one of these little, these I guess you can see it here, that is one unit. They stack uh, three, three high and three long. And this system of structure is extremely rigid relatively lightweight for what it is, and this could hold up probably three or four stories of construction if we were to apply it in that way. But currently, it's being used as a screen wall between the conference room and the open office at Local Motors. So this was probably at the time the second or third largest 3D printed polymer object in the world. This was made with 10% uh, fiberglass reinforced ABS. Uh, ABS polymer being the same thing that we made uh, the Amy project out of. But in this case, we're actually experimenting a little bit with color and starting to think about ways to make it a little bit more lightweight. And the next step beyond this in terms of polymer is to go with something that's either completely sourced on site, meaning the soil or the clay that you find on your construction site, or to use something that is not petroleum based. There's a really interesting project that uh, Oak Ridge National Labs worked with uh, another architecture firm at, at uh, our Miami last year, and they produced a structure made out of, I believe it was uh, PLA pellets reinforced with bamboo fiber. So something was completely inert. You could eat it as breakfast cereal if you wanted to, but it created a load-bearing 3D uh, printed structure. So that's kind of a little the freebie I threw in. This is the one that gets really interesting. This is called AMPT. Again, we have to have acronyms when we work with uh, folks out in Oak Ridge. This is Additive Manufacturing and Parametric Design. 
And by parametric design, I mean that we are automating certain parts of the design process because it gets more complex than what we can achieve with our own sort of design abilities. Um, this was an extension of what the students had done for local motors, but this time it was applied to an idea of a reception desk and a fixturing system to put in their main showroom. So the micro factory at local motors is not just a place where they produce the cars, it's where they would sell them and where you would come to have the experience of having a product delivered to you or you would meet people in, in terms of talking about what your, your design would be. So this would be the initial sort of handshake of local motors. So the students were really, again, interested in the idea of lightweight lattice structures, uh, somewhat replicative of bone, but they were also interested in the way that automotive interiors, particularly the ones from local motors, all of surfaces curve in and flow into one another. The dash flows into the armrest, flows into the door panel, flows into the seat. And so the idea here was to take several functions, design them in section, and then to loft those curves of that section into one continuous form. So you see at the beginning of this, it's a display. At the back corner, it's a bench that you might sit in when your car is wheeled out. There's a screen wall, a projection surface, and then there's a reception desk. So those were the, the functions discreetly woven into it. And then really all, of the, all the students created was that white surface. After that, the parametrics were involved. And that's where it gets pretty interesting. So the parametrics gave us the ability to de design the cross section of the tube that we wanted to think about the orientations because when we print these components there are certain things that we can't print too far of an overhang or we start dropping the beads of the material. There are certain other sort of uh, parametrics based on the, the chemical composition of the material. And so we can feed all of that information in and as long as we're getting the surface we want, we can let the computer optimize that structural system. And this was a relatively safe project in which to do this. We're not ready to do this on a multi-story building, but on a piece of what I call furniture, somewhere between furniture, somewhere between architecture and something larger, we could do it. So this is just kind of a diagram of the process that, that, that was involved. So it started out completely digital. We scripted the way the structural system would work. We then printed a full-size mock-up of a piece. If we were happy with that, we could print a small-scale model. Again, the model always being a derivation of the main file that can produce the entire piece. And then eventually, we're able to come up with a design that it looks different than our initial intention, but it is structurally optimized. And so this is the piece that was built. And the cool thing about it is that we have finally got it down to a very simple program. So between the initial form and this form, we have reduced the number of joint conditions. We've taken 50% of the material out of this. That's another fantastic story about this. 3D printing only puts the material where you need it. So it's much more efficient in, in terms of material. And this is scripted with only one operation. I know this, this little diagram doesn't mean anything to anybody, and that's, that's good because you shouldn't have to worry about that. But compare it to the one at the top. That's, that's where we went from. So about 12 operations down to one operation. And then the components were made in segments, very similar to what the way we did with the Amy prototype. And then these all get connected together with tension structures. And then, there we go. This was taken just two weeks ago. So I'm gonna pass this around. This is an end cap. This was a piece of the actual material of this bench. This has, I think, aluminum powder for the uh, coloration. And this is, I believe, also 10% uh, glass fiber reinforced ABS. Sorry for the, uh, the cops style shaky video, that was me with a cell phone. But think about the potential of this. So this was a reception desk, this was something relatively small. But we now have the ability to build something with only the amount of material that it needs. I think the last time we were able to do this was the Gothic cathedrals. And the only reason we were able to do that is we built it, it fell down, and we built it a little bit shorter the next time, right? We don't have to do that now. We, we can actually use some pretty complex uh, you know, thinking and uh, applying some computational skills and we can make extremely, I would say, evocative forms based on the nature of that material. So this is just one step. This, this is making something out of 3D printed, uh, I would say, plastic. What happens if we 3D print steel? What happens if we 3D print concrete? And these are things that are ongoing right now at the uh, manufacturing demonstration facility in Oak Ridge and I can't wait to work with them on that. So. Anyway, this is not the end, this is just kind of where we are right now, but I'm happy to open the floor if there are any questions. How did you attach the 
each section together. I have a picture of that on my cell phone that I didn't put in here, mm -hmm. but uh, there are four tension cables. Very similar to this one, there were two cables at the top, two cables at the bottom, and we just push everything together under tension. I, we did the same thing on that desk. Even though it's curvilinear, each one of the segments was pie wedged, so it was equal amounts of tension all the way around it. And there are just four cables, and we sucked it up tight, and that's how it holds together. What did you make the cable of? Cable is just uh, it's stainless steel, just standard, standard cable. How close are you to a multi-story building? I don't know. No one ha has asked us to make one, and, and maybe better yet, no one has funded it yet. So I don't know. They're, they're, uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill just finished a project that they're doing, I think, with the Marine Corps, doing a forward operating base, and they were 3D printing with uh, on-site um, soil and some concrete. You can look this up. There's a pretty fascinating video, but even that's one story. So I don't think it's quite gotten to that level, but that's going to happen soon. This is the problem with these things. I, for one, we can't get volunteers to do that, but it, it belongs to Oak Ridge National Lab. So it's sitting right now on a trailer behind, I think, the Building Technologies Group in, in Oak Ridge. So no one's occupying it right now, but it would be fascinating to know. Uh, I, I'm actually quite interested in the psychological aspects of it. That's why our solar decathlon house was a transparent structure, because no one really wants to live in that space that's you know, completely opaque just for the value of, of, of the insulation. So it's a good question, but as far as I know, no one's doing that. That's a very good question. So right now, uh, we, we would not put this in a, any installation where we needed a, a fire rating because that plastic will burn eventually if it gets hot enough because it is ABS. Uh, the, I think the PLA resin, actually since it, uh, I think it's, it's not quite as resistant as I think, uh, what's it, a phenolic resin, it's close to a phenolic which does not generate smoke. Uh, so I think if we wanted something that was fire rated, we'd go more in that direction. But currently it's ABS and it will, it will catch on fire. You couldn't use that as an outdoor classroom, the students. I don't know. I, I would have to check on the code on that. As a practicing architect, I would be, I would be hesitant to do it right now. We would like to have this project come back on campus at some point just for our students to be able to see it. I'm going to take a group out there in two weeks. But we have to go visit it. I would like to have it on campus. Have it on the outdoor classroom site on Cable Station Road in Perry. We we'll have to. We don't have a classroom there for. There's a, a shed, but we need a classroom because that serves. Will serve grades one through twelve. How big does it need to be? Well, that's we can talk about that later. But it needs to be about the equivalent of area-wise, or say a. 30 okay. high school students of that size. We're, we're very rapidly getting to the point where we could make I, that. I, I really think that's a good application for that because the kids are going to see that. That lasts all their lives. It would. And that's the, the next step, I think, is 3D printing with concrete, which has no fire problems at all. Uh, ever since I first toured the facility in Hardin Valley, I've been surprised at how heavy this is. It is. Car, everything. Is, there's no way to get that down. To Where did the uh, end cap go? So part of the reason why we're, we're interested in the, the lattice structures, well, it, it can continue to circulate. I was just going to point out that's hollow. So when you see the image of, let's go back to, actually, I think I've got one right here. So when you look at that car, that car chassis was designed to be completely solid. So I think from the outside of that to the inside of that surface is like an inch and a half, and it's completely solid material. And also with Amy, Amy is completely solid. Even though it's a thin shell, it was solid. So that was one of the reasons why we were looking at bone, because bone is a very lightweight but extremely structurally, you know, in, in integral structure. So that is probably the lightest way we know how to make these components. And to kind of go back to, let's see this image right here, yeah. That piece, I think, weighed about 70 pounds. So it's still heavy because ABS is very dense. But I think through the process of lightweighting it by making it more of a lattice, but also through changing what that material is, I think we can make it even lighter. The, the, uh, the, the PLA-derived material is significantly lighter than the ABS material. We need better material. 70. 70. 
We do, and that's and that's not not an area that I'm in, but I know there are a lot of people that are pushing that. Well, you know, we came up with Kevlar. What do we do with that? And that weighs nothing. That's right. There's got to be a way to develop some material that has incredible strength and yet it's light. And I think that the research going forward is two pronged. It's the material side, and it's also the, the formal side. Um, now, this automated design is slightly different from what I've heard called organic design, where you define a couple of points where there are going to be loads, right. and you just let a you know, multi-element simulation build the, uh, the structure. This is this is different. This is different. So if we had done a finite element analysis, it would have looked completely different because it would be tracking the point load and then distributing that load to wherever it's being supported. And we did do that as, as one of the, the uh, analyses, but we didn't like the way that looked. So, okay. well, <laughs> so yeah, that, but it, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. That is one way to look at it. But this is, uh, it, it is at least as structural as the finite element analysis version. We just wanted something where you could understand the grid as a totality. Because in the uh, in the uh, other systems, that point created uh, it created densities that tracked where the forces were, and that's great. In, in some instances, on a tall building, I can imagine that would be beautiful. But we were doing something at a smaller scale. Going back to the competition at the beginning of the presentation, what season of the year was that held? And that was in Washington D.C. Yep, uh, I believe it was. Um, the end of September, early October, right? I think that's right. I'd have to check. So it-, it, it And what do you do with humidity? Right, so that, that humidity was a big issue. We had two mini split heat pumps. Uh, they were by Daikin, and they did have cycles to dehumidify. So they all had little condensate lines. But frankly, that was the thing that I was least happy with. It was the humidity issue. Uh, other teams had used things like a desiccant wheel or a, um, um, it's almost like a desiccant tray that then you would have to reheat the components to, to drive out the humidity and try again. So we didn't do that. We were relying on the Daikin systems, and I have to say, I, I was not super excited about that. The desiccant tray, how, how do you move the material out of the space where it's absorbing the humidity into the place where it's going to get baked off? Is there a conveyor belt or something? Or? I think it was done by hand. Oh. It was a student project, and it was early in the, in the life cycle of that stuff. But yeah, I didn't work on that particular project, but I, I, I did go talk to that, that person to see what they did. But I believe they, they removed it, and I don't know how they drove the heat. Can you make these segments modular so that you could vary the span width in open space? Absolutely, you could. And can you fasten them together so that it'd be safe? Yeah, you can. Uh, there's a, another company I didn't mention called Branch Technology out of Chattanooga, and they've just created a 50-foot span out of 3D printed material. So it is, it's doable. There's a question back here. Yeah, I was going to ask um, for the optimization. Is it like a topology optimization code for, for strength or uh, printability or densities in certain areas? What was the way that you optimized the structure itself? Well, first it was all of them. It was too many parameters. So then we optimized one for structure. We did one for topology. We also did one for um, the print angle, which I didn't get into. But there's a, uh, the angle at which you can corbel one bead to the next, wherever that, that little end cap is. If you turn it upside down, pretty much that's how far you can, you can go from one bead to the next. And so I think what we ended up with is it's coded some for, uh, for corbel angle, but primarily it's topology. Uh, James, uh, come back to the convection. You mentioned all this in current. You tie the segment together with cables. So I'm just wondering if actually, let's say we're going to do a multi-story building, uh, uh, do we still need convection? If not, how are you going to do? Can you 3D printing two different materials at the same time? Yeah, the answer to all of that is yes. I just, we haven't gotten there yet. So the, uh, the, the reason for the cable right now is because the expansion and contraction of that material is somewhat unknown on that scale. So no one's really done the characterization. I can refer to a steel manual or a concrete manual, but I can't refer to a 3D print manual yet. So part of it was just not knowing what to expect. Uh, but uh, on, on small scale 3D printing, we can already print two different materials. 
and it will be available very soon at the large scale. The machine that is in the background, I think, I don't know which, eh, maybe it's in this, yeah. So the machine that's back here, there's a gantry, their 3D printer begins there and ends all the way out here somewhere, and it has gantries on it. So it's very possible to have a gantry with a coaxial extruder and print two different types of material. So you could have an elastomeric and a non-elastomeric if you wanted to make hinged components or varying density if you wanted to do structural optimization. So it's just whether someone needs to do that or not. So in other words, we can you know, create a reinforced concrete structure. Potentially, the, uh, the, the, if you go to the manufacturing demonstration facility, they've just 3D printed out of steel the front arm of a bucket loader. And so the, and apparently, I, I don't know if they've done all the optimization on that, but I believe it does not sacrifice any structural capacity for being 3D printed. Yeah, but it eventually would be really fantastic to be able to print the building, the inner uh, in enclosure, the outer enclosure, the rebar, the uh, conductors for wiring, it, it, it's, it's, it's possible. Uh, for these exterior structures of the solar panels, what kind of wind, wind load do you allow for? I think we're designing for, I think it's a 75 mile an hour gust in uh, East Tennessee. The interesting thing about the solar decathlon house is it uses something called Solyndra, which uh, no longer exists on the market, but instead of it being a flat panel, they were tubes. So imagine the photovoltaic is wrapped inside a glass tube. And the beauty of that is no uplift, and also snow loads are mitigated. Uh, hail damage is mitigated because you could only damage one tube, not the entire panel. It's a fantastic product, but it was too expensive for the market. Back to the Amy house. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I understood, but did you say it was movable, uh, or did you consider putting it on a turntable to you know, get the right angles? and? Stay away from that uh, summer heat. Yeah, let's see if we can get back to it. So the, the intent is it, would, it was a movable structure. It still is. Uh, it's been to, I think, the, uh, I don't know, there's a Contractors Association meeting in Florida. It's been up to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. But it, it lives on the back of a truck. So the hope was that everywhere it parked, you would find south and orient it so that there was no direct gain if you were trying to keep it cool, and then you could orient it for direct gain if you were trying to warm it. But it also has too many split heat pumps inside it. Well, I mean, if it was firmly installed, did you ever consider having where you push a button and it angles the way it wants to be? You, you could do it. I, I, would, I would have to do the math because I'd like to know whether the expense of the turntable and the power to move it was recouped by the change in orientation. But there are structures in, in architectural history that have done that. Yeah, those circular railroad tracks. Yeah, yeah, uh, turntables. Yeah, that, I think there was a, a, a Soviet architect back in the, the 50s who, who did it as well. So if I want us to go back a little bit, looking at the house car, house car interaction, sharing of energy, where, where do we start with that? in terms of implementing it in our communities? Is there an example of a community somewhere that is starting from scratch? I mean, when we're building houses, we're still doing it pretty old school. We're That's true. We're building infrastructure, we're still staying on our, our it's a good question. It's a good question. I, I think we're going to have to change going forward and do things a little bit differently. I think one of the things that I, I keep thinking about is with vehicle autonomy, it's just, this is kind of a sidebar, but I think it relates, that back in the, the 60s and 70s, we were going to have to redo the entire interstate highway system, put the guide cables in, repave it, and the, every car would have to have that kind of reader to stay on the interstate. Well, we found a way to solve it with advanced computational science and not have to change the infrastructure of the interstate highway system. So so my thought is an idea like the Amy system, where it's the car and the home sharing, doesn't really require changing the way we distribute electrical power, as long as we have a way to back feed to the grid, which most places we do. So then the next step, I think, would just be kind of moving construction more toward a more sustainable direction. And that's a tipping point issue, and I don't know when we'll achieve it, but one of the things that could help is, is not really thinking about square footage as a commodity. Size doesn't necessarily make architecture better. And I think we're starting to see that with the tiny home movement. So building smaller, building tighter, but building better insulated. And I believe, to, to a certain extent, the uh, automotive industry is ahead of us. They're, those cars are becoming more efficient all the time. 
And to a certain extent, they have the ability to off-site fabricate, which is the other thing about architecture. So we partnered with Clayton Homes to assemble this thing, because I think in the future, it's going to be easier to build off-site than it is on-site, because there's so much waste in building on-site. I think 20 to 30 percent of the materials that come to a job site are cast off as waste. And, and, and you know that's not because anyone's being poor at their job. It's just the way it is to cut things out of plywood and cut two by fours to length. So some of that can be optimized. I think I saw you yeah, first. In, in the near future, cities appear to be more efficient than having houses spread out all over the countryside. And you talked about the maybe being stackable in mm -hmm. the future, or could they be put in a, a high-rise framework where you have the steel superstructure and then these go into s slots on it? And then how to increase efficiency, would you be able to somehow link these? So if I was at home, but you were, and you wanted to heat or cool your module, could, is that a possibility also? Absolutely. All, all of this is basically starting to come to fruition now. There's an outfit called Skender, S-K-E-N-D-E-R, who is building, I think, in Chicago and in New York. And they're doing off-site fabricated residential volumes that are stacked up on site. And I believe, I, th I think they're five to eight stories, and they do exactly as you say. They have optimized HVAC systems with occupancy sensors. And if you're not home, it's not conditioning your, your home to anything other than just kind of preventing you know, pipes from freezing. So this stuff exists. Now, the, the, the interesting application is those are not 3D printed. They're relatively normatively constructed, but they're constructed in a controlled environment where they're in serial fabrication. So that's the next step. And I should say, I'm not necessarily an evangelist for 3D printing, I'm just interested in working in it, but I know that the world will not be 3D printed. Certain things will lend itself to it, and other things will not. But I think to get where you're talking about, I think we just have to embrace the idea of off-site fabricating at least components, if not volumes, uh, of, of construction. Uh, just to speak to Amanda's situation a little bit, uh, I've got solar panels at home, so I have 16 kilowatts of solar panels Great. to generate uh, up to about 60 kilowatt hours a day. Fantastic. That's my average usage. And if you look at a uh, extended range Tesla, they're talking about 75 kilowatt hours. So there's very comparable size. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that addresses your question or not. That's yeah, a good point. The mind shift in our society shifting to more greener, self, you know, uh, sustainable. How do we do that? How do we you know, have this, uh, these structures in place when we keep building, you know, going back to the same old habits? Yeah. Well, the same old is, is, is not adventuring into the future. And so <laughs> it's, it's what we know how to do yeah. the easiest when it tends to be. Yeah. Maybe expensive. one more question. Please go. The back. Um, what's the lifespan of one of these, and what do you think long term as far as um, if this is a plastic based exposed long term, it's going to break down and create more plastic you know, pollution, things mm -hmm. like that? Because that is a emerging thing we're having to tackle, especially here. Right. So for what we're doing now, no one knows really how long it lasts. The Amy project is it's coated, it's sealed with a uh, basically an automotive grade finish. So it, it has a lifespan that's relatively infinite, I think, uh, in, unless that coating breaks down. The good news about ABS is it's a commodity material. Uh, the blue wall that I showed you that the students did, that can be reground and reused infinitely. You, know, you just have to put the energy in it to grind it up and to re-extrude it. But the thing I would say is the thing that's changing the fastest in 3D printing is the material we 3D print with. So I'd mentioned there's a PLA based with the bamboo reinforcing. That's completely inert. Uh, it can be reground and reused, but it's also as, uh, essentially replenishable because it comes from biological sources. So that's the part that I'm most excited about. The issue is there's so few of these projects that we don't really know what the, the long-term aspects like uh, expansion contraction or UV damage, we don't really know. No one's done that characterization yet. So kind of what I do in this institute is I build things before they're ready to be built, and I realize that. But somebody's got to do it, right? And it's kind of fun, so that's kind of why I do it. Perhaps That's a good question. If there are more questions, Professor Rose could stay for a moment or so and have to answer them individually. In the meantime, may we all thank Professor Rose. Thank you. Thank you.